Good morning, church. It's wonderful to be in the house of the Lord with you all today. I want to extend a special welcome to those who are worshiping with us online or on television. This week, I walked into Pastor Ann's office, and she was on the phone with someone who's been worshiping with us on television for the last 15 years, and she was joining the church, and we got to receive her into membership in the church. It was a beautiful thing. She's now living in Onalaska and doesn't miss a single week with us. Friends, that's part of what generosity makes possible. It extends the ministry and mission of First Methodist, Methodist Houston across the city of Houston into East Texas and beyond. That's what we're talking about this month is generosity and stewardship. But not just financial generosity, although that's an important piece, but the stewardship of our entire lives lived in faith and in service to Jesus Christ. Our series and our stewardship campaign is called One Together. Throughout this season of generosity, we are seeking to be one together so that we can live into Jesus's prayer that he prayed in the garden before being arrested and crucified, that the world might see Jesus in us as we seek to be one together in Christ. We're modeling this campaign and this series around the prayer that we pray every time we come to the Lord's table, that by the Holy Spirit, God would make us one with Christ, one with each other, and one in ministry to all the world until Christ comes in final victory and we feast at his heavenly banquet. Last week... We talked about how we become one with Christ through worship. That is our vertical dimension. Worship is that place where we gather as the people of God and seek through our prayer and through our praise, through word and through table, to join our individual lives together as one, seeking to focus all of our energy, all of our passion on Jesus and to be swept up into the life of God. That is what our life of worship is all about. It's the vertical dimension to our lives. But there's another dimension as well that bears kind of a horizontal orientation. That's where we seek to be an answer to this prayer that we become one with each other. Discipleship is the way in which that happens. When we follow the Great Commission to go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, and teaching to obey everything that Jesus commanded. And in the Great Commission, Jesus reminds us, I am with you always, even to the ends of the earth, to the end of time. Discipleship is where we focus today, and it's part of the life of the church it's part of how we live into the mandate we find in Scripture to be the body of Christ, the Jesus that the world around us sees. And as we seek to be one together, one with each other, the world sees a model of how to live life together. The life sees an antidote to all the division that we're experiencing in our public life together, the world sees hope fulfilled. What starts here truly transforms and changes the world. I want to tell you a story before I read the scripture today about the birth of the church over 2,000 years ago. 50 days after Christ was raised from the dead, the day of Pentecost came. Jesus had ascended into heaven, but before he went, he commissioned the disciples. He said, wait here in the city of Jerusalem, and you will be clothed with power on, on, from on high, and then you will be my witnesses right here in Jerusalem and beyond to Samaria and all the way to the ends of the earth. And so the disciples gathered, and they waited, and they prayed. And on the day of Pentecost... When God had gathered the nations, believers from all over the globe, in Jerusalem for the festival, all heaven broke loose. In answer to the disciples' prayer and in fulfillment of Christ's commission. And those disciples began preaching the gospel 
in the languages of all that had gathered there for the festival of Pentecost. There were thousands of pilgrims in the city. And this was quite a commotion. And it was a miracle because through the Spirit of God, the disciples were empowered to preach the gospel in languages that they themselves had not learned, but that the people God had gathered spoke. And that brings us to the first miracle of Pentecost, and that's when the Spirit gets involved in the life of God's people, we begin to proclaim the gospel message in languages that the people gathered around the church begin to understand and can devote their lives to. Well, everybody wondered what the fuss was all about on this, the birth of the church. They began to say, are they drunk? And if you read Acts chapter 2, Peter says, no, we're not drunk as some suppose. It's only nine in the morning. And you could read people's thought patterns, right? Well, isn't it five o'clock somewhere, right? But Peter says, this has happened in fulfillment of what the prophet Joel proclaimed eons ago, that in these last days, the spirit shall be poured out upon all people and your sons and daughters shall prophesy. The young shall have visions and the old shall dream dreams. This is happening in fulfillment of the scriptures. And then Peter began to proclaim the gospel message, starting with the, the life of Jesus and how he was Messiah and Lord and how he had been nailed to the cross by those outside of the law, but that in the fullness of God's plan, God raised Jesus up from the dead and now the spirit has been given, poured out upon God's people. And all who were gathered were convicted. And they asked, what then shall we do in response to this good news that you have shared with us? And Peter said, repent, all of you, and be baptized so that your sins may be forgiven. To repent means to orient your life in a different direction. It means to turn aside and to set your face in a completely different direction from the direction you had been walking. Peter says, turn and be baptized into a death like Jesus so that you can be raised to a new life, swept up in the life of God through the resurrection of Jesus from the dead. 3,000 people proclaimed their faith in Jesus Christ and were baptized that day. And that was only the first day the church existed. The gospel has power. And what we see in the life of discipleship that we're about to enter into fully through this word is that the gospel message is multiplied through people striving together to live it out, to bear the word in their lives individually and together. That's when the gospel grows legs. So what happened as a result of the day of Pentecost and so many coming to faith? I invite you to stand as we hear the next part of the story from Acts chapter 2, verses 42 through 47. And as I read, listen now for a word from the Lord. They, the new converts, devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching and to fellowship, to the breaking of bread and the prayers. Awe came upon everyone because many wonders and signs were being done by the apostles all who believed were together and had all things in common. They would sell their possessions and goods and distribute the proceeds to all as any had need. Day by day, as they spent much time together in the temple, they broke bread at home and ate their food with glad and generous hearts, praising God and having the goodwill of all people. And day by day, the Lord added to their number daily those who were being saved. The word of God for us, the people of God, thanks be to God. You may be seated. When I was in College Station, Franklin Graham came to town. He was following in his father Billy's footsteps, hosting revival there, 
And in advance of this revival, I thought this was so very important. They were enlisting churches to be there, to be the ones to receive those who gave their lives to Christ as a result of the, the revival. And then the work of follow-up would continue. Names would be given back to churches to follow up with the people who had given their lives to Jesus so that they could continue to grow as disciples. The word enthusiasm, it literally means to be filled with the Lord. And, and so many revivalistic efforts end with the event where someone gives their life to Jesus. And then they go forth and nothing changes. Why is that? Well, because in the moment they were moved, but there's a critical piece missing. That piece is community. And Franklin Graham and his organization got that, that after you make a faith commitment, you need a community with which to walk and to learn and to live it out. That's why what we do week in and week out as the church is so very important because this is where the rubber meets the road. This is where we are forged in the word. This is where we live it out in relationship with one another. This is where we become Christ's body. And if we can apply this word in our relationships with each other, as hard as it is for Republicans and Democrats to be together in one church, think of it, right? With people who have different opinions about many things and can have hard conversations. Imagine if the world learned to talk about difficult things without demonizing one another, right? We get to put that into practice here so that others beyond the church can learn it, right? We, Christ has given us to become the hope of the world. What we do here is significant and it's important. And this was the practice of the early church. Will Willimon, in his commentary on the book of Acts, says the true miracle of Pentecost may not have been the outpouring of the Holy Spirit. And I would add, if that wasn't something extraordinary of itself, the true miracle of Pentecost was that the Spirit of God united people from every nation, tribe, and tongue into one. That is the miracle of a life lived in the Spirit of God. And church is the place where miracles happen. We truly can become one with each other through the Spirit of God working in, through, and among us. Acts 2, 42 through 47 details the practices that made the Pentecost life possible. First, these 3,000 converts devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching. Teaching is where we remind ourselves of the foundation of our faith, our doctrines, our core beliefs. I've been lifting up weekly that, that those are, are lifted up through the creeds. That's why we say an affirmation of faith every time we come together. What is the reason that we believe? What is the root of all of our practices? Well, we can say the creeds and be reminded of our foundation. Churches have gotten busy with many things in this age, yoga classes and, you know, all kinds of different things. And, and the social life of the church is really important, but sometimes we can be busy with many things, so much so that we neglect to sit at the feet of Jesus and to learn the word together. Teaching is one of the primary functions of our gathered life together. But they also devoted themselves to fellowship. And that word fellowship is actually a significant Greek word, quinonia. Everyone say quinonia. Yes, I hope that you'll remember this word because it's, it's so much more than just conversing with one another and living in holy friendships. It encapsulates all of that, but it's so much more. Quinonia is at its fullest extent communion. It's where our lives become intertwined with each other. It's where we experience the life of Christ in our relationships with one another. As we read through this section of, of Scripture, we learn some of the qualities of Quinonia. They broke bread together. They sold their possessions and gave so that anyone had need. I mean, think about in those days, widows and those who are orphaned would live in abject poverty. 
But the, the church, the fellowship of believers provided the material needs for people who lived at the margins. And everybody was, was equal in their life together. Nobody went without. That's quinonia. Table fellowship was part of it, where social norms are obliterated at table. That was an important part of the way in which people grew together in community and lived out the word with one another. Quinonia is so important. Next, they devoted themselves to the breaking of bread. Scholars don't know if they're talking about the Lord's Supper specifically or any meal eaten together. If Luke, who wrote Acts, would have only gotten specific about that, so many conflicts in the life of the church global could have been prevented, right? Because churches have argued a lot about communion over the centuries. But it's at both end. Remember, these, are, these early converts were Jewish persons who were used to Jewish table practices. And in their tradition, whenever people came together and blessed the meal, prayed before the food was eaten, that became a holy enterprise where God was seen to be present there with the people through the breaking of the bread. Maybe these meals were a foretaste of the heavenly banquet. You know that table where we feast in the presence of God in heaven in eternity? They broke bread together. And all of the social norms, like I said, were obliterated. When we read the Gospels, Jesus got himself in hot water a lot with the religious leaders who had words with him about who he ate with. Well, that man, Jesus, eats with tax collectors and sinners. And Jesus would say, yeah, and you're invited too. <laughs> right? Right? At the table all become one. And I love our practice of, of communion here in the United Methodist Church, that our table is open. Christ is the host and no one is denied the bread and the juice. At table, we really do become one across all of the different dividing lines that we like to draw between us and them. Right at this table, rich and poor, Black and white, the unhoused and the housed. You, you get it, right? All of the labels that we like to, to stick on everything. None of that matters here because we all become one in Christ Jesus. One together. That's quinonia, folks. And that's how the church lived into the Christian life. They devoted themselves finally to the prayers and it's believed that these were prayers prayed on the hours, a, a Jewish ritual practice that kept people disciplined in conversing with the Lord and bringing the needs of the community before God. I was convicted reading this passage this week that I ought to set alarms, that was perfect cue, on my phone to remind me to pray at certain times of the day for you all and for our church and for our community and for our world. The discipline of prayer is powerful. Now notice worship hasn't been mentioned up to this point, but it's about to. Day by day, they met in the temple courts. That was for praise and for worship and for the proclamation of the word. But that didn't center and ground the life of the community. You know what it did? Teaching in small groups. Table fellowship in small groups. Think back to COVID for just a moment. What anchored you to the body of Christ during COVID? When everything seemed to shut down, worship was not held in person, what would make somebody show up for a Zoom worship service? That's what we were doing in Austin when I was there. Do you know what was the glue that held people together during COVID? It was small groups. It was Sunday school classes who'd been together for a long time. It was people showing up at the same hour on Zoom to check in on each other and to gather around the word. It was folks calling each other on the phone and checking in to make sure people were okay. It was knowing that you were known and loved and missed and thought of by other people. 
That was the glue that kept people connected. And those who were most committed, you know, choir is a, a group too, right? Your people. Those were the first to return. The faithful remnant, if you will, of the first back after things began to open up. And there's no, that's no mistake. People everywhere I go wish for full sanctuaries once again. And, and I do too, because that means that's all the people that are swept up into the life of God, right? Growing together in community. Worship is the assembly or the gathering of the people of God. But I would submit to you that the church isn't grown through worship. We can put out billboards. We could put ads on social media. We can invite people all we want. But studies are showing more and more that people don't enter the church through their first entry through worship. They do through service and or through small groups. Think about that for just a moment. Here's why. The life of the church is experienced at the most powerful level in small groups where people are calling and checking on you. When you come home from the hospital and a casserole arrives, when you're laid up in bed and somebody visits and checks up on you, you end up in jail and somebody comes to see you, right? That's in there somewhere in the gospel, right? None of you would ever do that. But that's where we experience the life of the church at the deepest level. Something amazing happened in Acts. As they devoted themselves to the teaching and to the fellowship and to the breaking of bread and to the prayers, everybody gave and sold their possessions and shared the proceeds so that any with want would have that need fulfilled. They worshiped in the temple and met together in homes and ate with glad and generous hearts. And there was a sense of goodwill among all of them. And the scripture ends this way. And the Lord added to their numbers daily those who were being saved. We work out our faith and our salvation in relationship with one another. And that's why the life of discipleship is central for us as Christians. Friends, we will have commitment Sunday next week. And my hope and prayer for all of us is that we would prayerfully consider making a commitment to support the ministry of First Methodist Houston in 2023 with our prayers, our presence, our gifts, our service, and our witness. Financial generosity fuels mission. It was, it's what makes our music ministry possible. It's what keeps the lights on and provides an address where hope can be found, where people can connect with our community. It's where we send out missionaries, us, to be a part of the work of God in the world. What starts here transforms us so that we can make a difference in the world around. As an example of this, next Sunday, we have a missionary with us in the fellowship hall. And Sunday school classes are combining that have decided to do so to hear from somebody that we have sent out in the mission field. And I hope that if your class is there, that y'all will participate and, and be fed by that. That's part of what your ministry supports, what your generosity makes possible. Friends, my prayer is that we would be one together, one with Christ through worship, one with each other through growth as disciples, and one in ministry to all the world, transforming the world around with the, world, the love of Christ. Friends, let's seek to be one together in the days ahead. Let us pray. God of love, we thank you for your Holy Spirit that you have poured out upon the people of faith that gives us power to live your life and love in relationship with one another. God, we thank you for our small groups and Sunday school classes, both short-term and never-ending. The source of our fellowship and connection to the body of Christ. Lord, I pray that for those who don't have a small group, Lord, that you would help connect them to a place where they can plug into community, 
and be fed with the word of God and with the food around the tables that gather. God, I pray that our Sunday school classes would be places of welcome for new people and that they would share your life and their relationships with one another. And God, I pray that we would be a part of raising up teachers who can start new short-term and long-term small groups so that all who are disconnected would find a place of connection and life in your church. God, forgive us when we have neglected the needs of one another and when we have neglected our lives and community. Help us through part of this One Together campaign to recommit to the life of faith through our prayers, our presence, our gifts, our service, and our witness. All of this we pray in the name of Jesus Christ, who is still teaching disciples to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. this charge. I am a product of people who have poured into me over the years. I remember teachers when I was a child who taught the word to me, who did numerous crafts with me, who dealt with my antics in church. And, and I'm standing before you because of people just like you who taught children's Sunday school and youth Sunday school, worked with college students and led young adult and adult Sunday school classes. I wanna give you this charge. Pray about leading a small group. We need online small groups to connect with our TV and online congregation. We need volunteers who would sacrifice time in their own classes on rotation to lead in the nursery and with children and youth. We need more adult Sunday school classes for the new people that God is calling. And so I ask you to pray about that.